Good morning, beloved, and thank you for joining us for worship this morning at Epworth United Methodist Church online. Uh, I am Pastor Bill Jones, and I serve as the ordained deacon here at Epworth and uh, work with the youth ministry and missions, and I serve alongside our lead pastor, Pastor Terry Kofiel. And uh, once again, we're so thankful that you've joined us for worship this morning. Um, and I was just reflecting with, with Mike how, you know, even though this isn't the way we want to be gathered, I am so thankful for the many creative ways we have found to continue to be together as community. Um, all the, the youth doing daily check-ins and Bible study and youth group on Sundays using the different platforms and technologies that we've found to use. Um, <clears throat> Pastor Terry being able to gather with people uh, each morning during the week for a time of conversation and coffee and prayer. It's really wonderful that we find creative ways to be able to step up and gather together as a worship community. What a blessing that is. So I don't have many announcements uh, other than those different ways that we are finding to gather over the course of the week. Please join in those as you are able. And if you want more information on those online gatherings, uh, please contact the church office. Uh, Kara is checking all the emails and, and messages, and she will respond to you and let you know. Or you can contact myself or Pastor Terry, and we can help you out with that also. Um, so we know that announcements were made by Governor Hogan yesterday uh, concerning the stages for reopening. Uh, we are still awaiting guidance and direction from our, our bishop and the conference for how that will work for the churches, and as soon as we have that information, we will share that with you. Uh, but it is going to be in incremental stages. So when we're able to fully gather together again, we're not sure, but as soon as we know, we will let you know. So um, celebration gatherings, things like that, may be down the road a bit, but they will happen. They will happen. The other announcement I have for today, um, very near and dear to my heart, as many of you know, we have a scholarship fund at Epworth known as the Mar Margareta Griffith Scholarship Fund. This was established to set aside funds that we could give to students that are going off to college um, to be able to help them with some of the tuition bills and books and everything else that they might need. Uh, this year, we have nine eligible graduating seniors from high school that are getting ready to go off to college. And that's in addition to college students that we already have in college that are also eligible for this scholarship. The concern that we have, because we haven't been able to gather together, is we haven't been able to collect funds into that scholarship the way we normally would. Uh, so currently there's only about $450 in there to divide up a, between probably about 15, 16 people. So I'm asking this morning, in addition to your normal giving, if you can make a contribution to the Margareta Griffith Scholarship, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. And then those funds, we will find ways to divide that up and give that to students to help them as they either begin their college career or continue their college career. So if you find that in your hearts to do, we would greatly appreciate that. And if you want more information on that scholarship, please let me know. Applications have already gone out. Uh, to all the, all the students that are eligible. Uh, if I'm saying that, you're like, wait a minute, I didn't see that, that's fine. Get in touch with me and I will give you all the information that you need. So with that, that's all the announcements I have for this morning. Uh, let us begin our time of worship and praise. <laughs>
Our intro today is from the Worship and Song. It's number 3008, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. So please join with me as we sing our intro together. Please join us in our call to worship for today. When Mary heard Jesus speak her name on Easter morning, her grief gave way to joy. She hurried to tell the disciples, I have seen, I have seen the, the Lord. Lord. When on that same day Jesus appeared to the eleven in the locked room, offering peace and breathing his Holy Spirit into them, their anxiety gave way to wonder. When Thomas arrived, they couldn't wait to share the news. We have seen the Lord. When Jesus walked with two others on the Emmaus Road that same evening, when he opened their minds to the scriptures and revealed himself in breaking bread, their doubt gave way to certainty. They returned to Jerusalem to join the others in proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Holy Lord, in these days of grief, anxiety, and uncertainty, we gather remembering you have called us each by name. You have breathed your spirit into our hearts and made yourself known to us in bread and cup. Open our minds to your holy word and stir our hearts that everything we say and do reveals you to others. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, if you would please join us in our hymn of praise, Christ Has Risen. It's in the faith we sing, number 2115. The words will be on your screen. Thank you. 
blessings of this crazy way we're worshiping has been our children's messages. I received an email message the other day from someone in a church I served almost 30 years ago who said, please tell the woman who has been doing your children's sermons that she is a rock star. We would agree with that, and we are so thankful that Stuart, her son, has been home with her, who is her cameraman, director, technical advisor, set designer, anything, all of the above. So we are very blessed again to have a message from Debbie Rustin. Hi, everyone. It's Miss Debbie. I'm just checking back in on you this week, see how you're doing. We talked last week about wondering and about doubt and this week we're going to sort of continue that story maybe about some doubt maybe about uh something that somebody couldn't believe have you ever thought about that ha did something happen to you where you thought i can't believe this our story today starts with our map when jesus died it all happened sort of around jerusalem and then when everybody started to go home from Jerusalem because they had come for the Passover and there were lots and lots of people in Jerusalem who didn't live there. Not everyone knew that Jesus had risen from the dead. So there were two friends who were on their way home and that's where our story begins. That same day, Cleopas and his friend were walking home to their village in Emmaus about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were not able to recognize who he was. Jesus asked, what are you talking about so intently as you walk along? What are, are you the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about what's gone on in these last few days? Well, uh, what has happened? The things that happened to Jesus. He was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death and crucified him. And we had our hopes up. We thought he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel and now it's the third day. And and our some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning, they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with a story that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of our friends went off to see the tomb to check and found it empty, just as the women had said. But they didn't see Jesus. Then Jesus said, Oh my, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted. Why can't you simply believe all the prophets have said? Don't you see that these things had to happen? That the Messiah had to suffer? And only then come into his glory. Then Jesus started at the beginning with the books of Moses and went on all through the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. They came to the edge of the village where they were headed. Jesus acted as if he was going along on his way. But Cleopas said, stay and have supper with us. It's late, you should come and stay with us. So he went in with them. He sat down at the table with them Taking the bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him. And then he disappeared. Back and forth they talked. Didn't we feel on fire when he was talking to us? Didn't we know as he opened up the scriptures for us? They didn't waste a minute. They ran back to Jerusalem. Wow, what a story. What an exciting thing to happen to Cleopas and his friend. And then to suddenly realize and recognize that it was their risen savior with them. They were 
They were so excited to run back to Jerusalem and share the news that they had seen Jesus. They had seen Jesus. I can't believe it. I'm sure they thought to themselves, how could this happen? Jesus made himself known. He appeared to them, but he also touched them personally so that they recognized him. That's what we should hope for in our doubts that Jesus will come and touch us personally in some way and that maybe one day we'll all be back together again and we can break bread together. And when we do that together, Jesus is there with us. How about we say a prayer? Everybody fold your hands. Let's fold our hands, everyone. Okay. God of wonder, help us to understand that you're here with us. Help us to remember that we should look for you, that we should wait for you to call our names and touch us personally so that we know that you're here with us. Help us when we break bread together, when we read stories in our Bibles, that you're here with us and that you love us so much. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Have a great week. Learn some more things online and shout your stuffy's name for me one more time oh i'm so glad you bring your stuffies with you have a good week everyone see you next time
Another of the surprises that we've had along the way in this strange way to worship is our mystery liturgist du jour. And this morning we welcome Katie Bellinger. Katie, thank you so much for being with us. And how are you all doing in this crazy time of isolation? You're welcome. We are doing well. Good morning, Epworth family. Amen. Katie's going to share with us our epistle lesson and a prayer. A reading from the first book of Peter, chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. If you invoke as father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. And now a prayer for our uncertain times. This is from Brother Michael Graham. We bow our heads. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health and making their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools close remember those who have no options. May we who have to cancel our trips remember those who have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market remember those who have no margin at all. May we settle in, who, we who settle in for a quarantine at home remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. And during this time, when we may not be able to physically wrap our arms around each other, let us yet find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbors. Amen. Amen, and thank you so much. We are leaving John's Gospel this morning to go to Luke for a story that appears only there. It comes from the 24th chapter. And it begins now on that same day, and that is the day of our Lord's resurrection. We begin at chapter 24, verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead of where as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, 
blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions together. They were saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. People have been saying, what do you miss most during this time of isolation? I miss human contact. I haven't hugged a person or shaken a hand other than my dogs in quite a while now. But one of the other things I am missing greatly is baseball. I have not lived in the Baltimore area in 36 years, and I was looking forward to being at Camden Yards and seeing some games live for the first time in a long time, more than maybe one a year if I was lucky enough to get down here for that. And I remember even going to Memorial Stadium as a child. I remember being carried into Memorial Stadium as a child. And I remember when you're going in, that sense of excitement, the crowd is just a buzz. They're all expectant and hopeful, and there's just this great energy in the air until they lose a game, which the Orioles have sometimes been known to do. It's a different scene on the way out of the ballpark. People are not talking and laughing. People's heads are hanging low. People are sort of grumbling their way to their cars. It's a little bit like Easter evening for Cleopas and the unnamed disciple on the road to Emmaus. They're on foot. They're walking. They're dejected because as he says to Jesus, we had hoped he was the one only to find that their Savior was killed, put into a tomb, and then, although the women said they had seen a vision of angels, they still did not believe. They were hopeless. And a stranger comes to them on the road. Now, I've said we hear the story of Easter just as the story of Christmas in a different way depending on our circumstances of life. Never have we experienced anything like we've experienced this Lent into Easter. Back before Easter, I put on my Facebook a meme that was going around, it said, of all the Lents, this is the Lentiest Lent I've ever Lented. And that is what it feels like now. We're still waiting for Easter. We're still waiting for that time of redemption. And we find ourselves maybe feeling like the disciples locked away in fear because we're afraid of the virus and what it will do if it gets into a body of people. Churches, unfortunately, and funerals and choirs have been a cause of the spread of the virus in other places. One of the reasons that both the governor and our bishop have decided that for now we worship remotely. We also find ourselves perhaps a little jealous of Cleopas and the unnamed disciple because they're on the road, they're walking, they're talking, and they meet a stranger. I don't know if they shook hands, but they're talking to a stranger. They are not observing safe distancing. They didn't have a mask on. And then as he prepares to go ahead, they say to him, come and stay with us. They invite him into the home where they are staying the night. And they sit at the table with him, and they break bread. Now, the words sound familiar. It was in the breaking of the bread that he was made known to them. We'll get back to that in a little bit. But let's go back and talk about what they said on the road before they got to the place where they stayed for the night. They're walking along. They're talking about their broken hearts. They're talking about their dashed dreams and their hopes that have not been fulfilled. And a stranger says to them, what's up, guys? They look at him and they say, are you the only person who doesn't know what's happening? It would be like Jesus saying today, what virus? Everyone knew. The whole town of Jerusalem, and it was quite the city even in that time, the whole of the city was talking about the pretend son of God who had been nailed to the cross and buried. There were those who had hoped, they said, and they were among the hopeful because they had been with those disciples in Jerusalem. Indeed, they are disciples of Jesus until his body is gone, and they cannot understand the women's testimony. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, who is also a bishop of the Church of England, an Anglican bishop, has written that part of the reason that we know that the story is true is because it was told by witnesses who were not considered to be worthy. No one would ever allow a woman to testify in a legal matter in that time. And so by having the 
Gospels, all four record that women were the first to arrive at the tomb, the first to share the news of his resurrection, that certainly this must be a true story. Otherwise, they would have had a better story planned out ahead of time. Jesus must be a little disappointed when they say, we had hoped he was the one. We had hoped, meaning their hope is no longer there. And he chastises them a bit and says, how slow of heart must you be? But then he begins to speak to them. He opens their minds to the scripture. He does something in his speech that stirs their hearts within them so that when they think he's going on ahead, they want him to stay with them. That's when we get to the dinner. Sounds like Holy Communion, doesn't it? He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he shared it. But those are the same words that Jesus uses in that story from Luke of the crowd that gathered, that shared the bread and the fish. He took the bread, he gave thanks to God, he broke it. Whenever Christ comes to a meal, it doesn't have to be a sacrament, but he is made known to them in the sharing, in the hospitality, in the welcome, in the forgiving grace that even though they had been doubtful, here he is still in their midst, staying with them, talking to them until finally they see him. We don't know why they couldn't recognize him. It's that they were kept from recognizing him. It doesn't necessarily mean that God prevented their vision, but it means that they weren't looking for him. They didn't expect to see him because they expected that he was dead and gone, even if someone had stolen his body, which was the rumor spread to make it look like a hoax. They couldn't see him because they didn't know that he had been raised until he broke the bread and their eyes were open, not the eyes in their head, the eyes of their hearts, and they could see that Christ was in their midst and just as he had done in the locked room full of disciples, he was gone in a heartbeat. Now they had just walked, we heard about seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. But they were so excited, so overjoyed, so filled with wonder, and so unable to hold on to that news any longer that they got up and they ran back another seven miles. They found the disciples, and they, they were sharing the story of Peter seeing Jesus. They were sharing the story even in their fear, and they greeted these two with what has become the great profession of Easter morning, the Lord is risen indeed. And then they shared about their encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. We can learn a lot from this story, even in our time of isolation. We can learn about what we're called to do as Christ's disciples until we can get back on the road again. Jesus asks them what happened, and they begin with the story of his death. They begin with the story of how he had been their hope they begin with the story of his burial and the empty tomb, and that's the beginning of the practice. And then as he opens their minds to the scriptures, he begins at the beginning of the Hebrew scriptures. He talks to them about Moses. He shows them line by line how he is the fulfillment of the promises of old. And then they can't keep that story to themselves, and they go and they tell, and then they tell, and they tell, and they tell, and they tell until we tell it today. There's an interesting feature that's happened with remote worship. We are getting more people attending worship remotely online than in churches. That's a phenomenon that's being experienced all over the Christian church. And people are doing some research into it, and they're finding that agnostics, people who may believe but may doubt, sort of like Cleopas and the unnamed disciple on the road, are finding themselves pulled towards something looking for answers, looking for meaning in what's happening. Even some folks who are sworn atheists have been checking out worship services to see what's going on. So we are being able to share the story. And another thing we're able to share is dinner, not together, and it breaks my heart not to have Holy Communion. I am a sacramentalist to my core. It breaks my heart not to be able to share with you the body and blood of Christ. But it enlivens my heart to hear what you're sharing around your table. One of the things that has been lost in American culture in the 21st century is family dinner. Because of schedules with sports and scouts and youth group and everything else, families are pulled in 100 directions every day of the week. Choices have to be made. Now families are sitting down together, probably more than they ever hoped they would, but they're not taking it for granted anymore. Grandparents are gathering for Zoom meals. And just a few weeks ago, 
during the time of the Passover, Jewish families gathered with their relatives around the country and around the world and sat at table together because their hearts were joined by what they were celebrating, God's redemption of the Hebrew slaves from Egypt. Just as we sit at the Last Supper together and as we had a virtual love feast on Easter morning to remember that we are joined in heart even when we are not joined. Let me tell you something about family dinners. They're important. They're more important than we realized. There was a doctor, there is a doctor. She teaches at the Harvard Medical School. Her name is Ann Fischel, and she is co-founder of something called the Family Dinner Project. She's also a therapist, and what she writes is, as a family therapist, I have often had the impulse to tell families to go home and have dinner together rather than spending an hour with me. Studies have found that children who have dinner regularly with their parents around a table have better physical and mental health. They do better in school because they feel that someone is listening to them as they share together around the table in the evening. And we're called not to just share with each other, but to extend that hospitality to others. I have been so moved by those of you who have called to say, I am willing to go to the store and shop for anyone. And also those who have said, if someone cannot afford food, I am willing to go out and buy food and deliver it to them myself. We also are trying to find a way to safely gather and distribute food. We're looking at ways to do that here from Epworth Church as more of our neighbors cannot eat because they're not receiving any paycheck right now. I think the best part of the story, though, is what is true for us, especially now, that even when we don't recognize him, Jesus Christ is with us, just as he was with those unnamed disciples. Those unnamed disciples have lived through the ages. They're the ones who have carried the story of Jesus Christ from generation to generation around tables, in homeless shelters, in soup kitchens, in churches, in the office, in the schoolyard, wherever people gather, people are sharing Christ. I found something funny the other day on Facebook. There are a lot of funny things on Facebook. This was not the funny haha. This was the funny weird. Someone said that there is nothing of God on Facebook because those posts are taken down. Let me tell you, there's plenty about God on Facebook. I put a scripture verse up every single day of my life. And people are sharing their faith. They're sharing their hope. They're sharing the story of Christ's resurrecting love that transforms us and makes us new. I wonder if you, when you saw the sermon title, if you looked at the sermon title, it's called On the Road Again, if that song from Willie Nelson started to go through your head. It's a song that has been become sort of the national anthem of the road trip. And while we are waiting desperately, I love the Ocean City commercials that say, we're still here, stay home, we'll be here when you're ready to come back. When it's safe to come back, we will be here. We all long for vacations and being able to get out and sing with the windows open and without a mask on along with the radio. On the road again, I just can't wait to get back on the road again. We want to be out. We want to be together. We want to gather. We want, I want to preach to people and not looking in a camera lens. I want to see your faces smiling back at me or even frowning back at me. I would take that right now. But until that time, practice sharing the story. Practice around your table. Practice through social media. Call someone who is alone in this isolation time and share your faith in Jesus Christ. Share yourself. Share all that you are and all that you have. And then you will find that Christ is next to you. Christ is within you. Christ is in the mirror when you look there because you are embodying his love, his grace, his peace, his truth. Because even when we don't recognize him, he is our companion. And that alone is cause to rejoice. Alleluia. Amen. I invite you now to join as we sing together from the faith we sing, number 2161, to know you more.
beloved, this is our time where we have the opportunity to share our joys and our concerns. And again, I am very thankful that we are continuing to, to do that. Um, it is such a wonderful thing to see the outpouring of, of love and prayers from our community for so many. Um, please keep it up and please keep, keep sending in your, your prayers uh, so that we can lift them up and worship together on Sunday mornings. The joys that I have for this morning, uh, the first says huge hugs of gratitude to Susan Roscoe, who works tirelessly to assist others with their food shopping. So thank you, Susan. You are a joy. Um, another is Rachel Rao, one of our youth in Hype, uh, received a scholarship from Chick-fil-A in Hunt Valley, where she works. Um, so congratulations, Rachel. That is fantastic. We're, we're happy for you and celebrating with you. We also want to lift up uh, a joy for joy and concern for all of our frontline and essential workers uh, from the church. We thank you for what you're doing. It is making a difference, and it is um, giving us a sense of hope and relief to know that you are there. Uh, it matters. It matters to all of us. So thank you for that. And we are praying for you because you're putting yourself out there uh, in tremendous ways and can't tell you how much we appreciate what you're doing. Uh, concerns for today to lift up. We want to uh, continue prayers for Kay Ely's sister Alita in Tucson. Please uh, continue to keep her in your prayers. We also lift up uh, Buck, who is a friend of Pastor Terry's, who was diagnosed with COVID-19 and has been disconnected from life support this week. Um, one of the, unfortunately, many um, devastating stories that we've been hearing too much of recently, but please keep Buck, uh, his friends, and his family uh, in your prayers. We lift up Mark and Jerry, also friends of Pastor Terry's, uh, have both been diagnosed with COVID-19. We ask for prayers for Burke Sullivan, a friend of Mark Whiteford's, um, who uh, regrettably um, has died after contracting COVID-19. So please keep uh, Burke's family and Mark uh, in your prayers in this time. We ask for prayers for Ann Rogers uh, and for... Keith Owens, who's a friend of Katie Bellinger, uh, he began chemotherapy for cancer this past week. Uh, and we also ask that you continue to pray for Ross, Ross and Kim Myers. Ross is continuing um, to have chemotherapy treatments as his cancer has returned. So please keep them in your prayers also. And that's all the prayers that we've had shared for today. Uh, but again, please continue to share them because we are grateful and thankful for the opportunity to pray for all of you and for all of us to pray for one another together. Up as a joy, your continued financial support of the congregation and ask that you continue this as best you're able. We're facing some difficult times now, especially with our uh, Epworth Children's Center and We've remained open, and that's questionable right now because of the possibility of exposure. And we have very few kids enrolled right now. So we do ask your faithful continuation of your offerings as you're able to do that. But we also ask that you reach out in concern and love to your neighbors who might be doing without. And now let us go to God together in prayer. Holy God, we thank you and we praise you that when we feel alone, you are next to us. We thank you and we praise you when we feel that hope is gone, that your arms surround us because you are not limited by time or space or social distancing. You are with us. You are in our hearts. You are in our lives. And we pray that you would be in our vision, in our speech, in our hearing, so that all that we do reflects your glory. We thank you for the joys that we shared this morning and for the joy of being able to worship. We thank you for those who come together every week to provide worship services, even at risk to their own health. We do thank you and praise you for those on the front lines, not just the medical and emergency workers, 
but the people who deliver our packages and our mail and who stock the shelves in the grocery stores, who sometimes put up with great abuse because of the fear of others. We thank you for everyone who has taken your word to heart and shared it with others because we are only here because someone loved us enough to tell us the good news of a savior that you have sent to be our salvation, our guide, our example, our way, our truth, and our life. So it is in his name that we lift before you the needs of those spoken here this morning, the needs of those who are struggling right now, those who are dying alone in hospitals, those who are homeless and cannot wash their hands because they don't have access to running water or soap. We pray for those most vulnerable, for those in nursing homes who are living right now in fear and in isolation. We pray for those who wish to be with them but cannot those who are missing their parents and wondering if their parents will even recognize them when this is over. We pray for those whose hope has turned to despair and ask that you would inspire us to reach out to them with the news of your hope that is eternal. So when they cannot see Christ, may they see Christ in us, in our caring, in our actions, in our words, in our self-giving love in the name of the one who gave himself for all of us and who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, Our Father who art, who art in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn comes from the United Methodist Hymnal, number 430. O Master, let me walk with thee. Jesus joins us on our roads and walks with us even in our isolation. This is a prayer that we might always walk with him. Let us sing together. This is the good news, that we have a Savior who was raised for our sake, who will never leave us or forsake us, who is with us. Even when we don't recognize him, he is with us. Even when we doubt, he is with us. Even when we're frustrated and angry and cry out to God, he is with us. 
Let that be your peace. Let that be your comfort. Let that be your hope. And more than that, let that be your proclamation. Because too many people live not knowing that they have a Savior who loves them. Let them know it through your love and your mercy and your forgiveness and your grace. And the blessings of God Almighty, who is Father, who is Son, who is Holy Spirit, will be with you now and for always. Amen.